Welcome back for our third week of study of Luke 15. Those of you that have been here for all of them, you're to be commended to listen to me for that long. Two weeks ago, we studied the parable of the lost sheep, where we discussed how the Pharisees and scribes could not believe that Jesus would associate with tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees looked down on them and could not associate with them whatsoever. And as a shepherd loves and cares for the lost sheep, so does Jesus. Jesus even went to the grave for the lost. And we also read where the entire village would celebrate and feel joy upon the return of the lost sheep, just as in heaven. Last week, we looked at the woman who lost a silver coin, and even though she had nine left, the one missing meant so much to her. So much so that she had to light the lamp in her dark room and sweep the dirty floor in an attempt to just see a little bit of the shiny coin. And how jubilant and excited she was when she found that coin. Just like the joy that the angels and God have over one sinner that repents. Today, we'll be finishing up Luke 15 as we look at the lost son. Remember last week when I said it was going to be a short week? Yeah, I did. This is a long week. So sit back and enjoy. But before we get started, I want to tell you a story about this young mother who was putting her four-year-old daughter to bed one night. And she read to her the story of the prodigal son. They discussed how the young son had taken his inheritance and left home, living it up until he had nothing left. Finally, when he couldn't even eat as well as pigs, he went home to his father, his father who welcomed him. And when they finished the story, she asked her daughter what she learned. The little girl sat there and thought and pondered for a few moments before she said, never leave home without your credit card. <laughs> and even though this is not really what Jesus had in mind with this parable, the girl did have an interesting answer. This morning we're going to look at seven points Yes, seven. It could have been more, but I left it at seven. It is, isn't it? The first one being, one, the lost son's desire. So let's read Luke 15, verses 11 and 12. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. This was an unusual request by the younger son. But not altogether unheard of in the ancient world. Normally sons would inherit their father's estate upon death, but... There was a provision in the ancient Jewish law for the son to request the gift of his inheritance during his father's lifetime. He didn't have the authority to dispose of that property, but he was entitled to the income from it. The Deuteronomic laws also had certain instructions regarding inheritance. Deuteronomy 21.17 says, But he shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Since there were only two sons in this story, the younger son would receive a third of the total property of the father. And Jesus does not elaborate as to why the younger son wanted his share or why his father gave it to him so quickly. But we can surmise a few things. First, the younger son decided he wanted to be independent of his father. He wanted to make his own decisions. He no longer wanted to live by his father's rules. How many of you can relate to that? Growing up, how many of you couldn't wait to be on your own? As I look at my daughters up there. Making your own rules because you thought your parents were being way too strict and demanding. This is easily translated into our relationship 
with God as well. If we decide we want to run, run our own lives independent of God and live by the rules that we make, God gives us that freedom. He didn't say it made it easy. The son didn't even ask nicely. Or even ask at all, really. The younger son demanded it from his father. As if he had a right to the property. Can you imagine going up to your parents and say, I know you are still alive and well, but you need to give me what you have designated in your will for me right now. I don't care if you're still using it. You just need to hand it over. The father, being gracious and probably a bit heartbroken, did as his son wanted and divided everything and gave him his share. The youngest son was only thinking of himself and nobody else. Definitely not about his father that made sure he had a roof over his head or clothes to wear. Matthew Henry wrote that the father gave the younger son what he asked, and the son had no reason to complain that he did him any wrong in the dividend. He had as much as he expected and perhaps more. By doing so, maybe the son would see his father's kindness, how willing he was to please him and make him easy, and that he was not such an unkind father as he was willing to represent him when he wanted an excuse to be gone. The second point. See, they're going quickly. The departure. So the son gets his way. He gathers his things and his inheritance, and he is getting a bit antsy at this point. Luke 15, verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. He wanted to be on his own completely and distance himself from his father. He went to a completely different country. Matthew Henry stated that a sinful state is a state of departure and distance from God. And I hope you can see the parallel here. Just as the son distanced himself from his father, when we sin, we are departing or distancing ourselves from God. And the son thought he could handle things much better than his father. But as verse 13 finishes, we find that he squandered his property in reckless living. Based on the wording, the son would have probably drank the best liquor, had the wildest parties, and basically indulged in whatever he wanted to. And whoever. Sometimes we like to travel to distant places where we know nobody, where no one knows us, and where we, where we can do whatever we please without fear of being recognized or caught. And at this point, the resemblance becomes apparent between this parable and the parable of the lost sheep. Both the younger son and the sheep wandered off and became lost in a far country. And there we are told the young man wasted his substance. In a very short period of time, all that was given to him by the father was utterly wasted on riotous living. The details are not given, but we know how easy it is for people to spend a fortune when they are caught up in the revelry of a wild and undisciplined style of life. So this young man's inheritance slipped through his fingers, and suddenly it was gone. He had a new, carefree lifestyle like he wanted. But we can tell it was not fulfilling because Jesus said he squandered or wasted his wealth. The son made two decisions that led to his ruin. He first decided to live independent of his father. And second was to seek fulfillment in sin. A group of tourists spent hours Saturday night looking for a missing woman near one of Iceland's canyons. The group was traveling through Iceland on a tour bus and stopped near a volcanic canyon. Soon there was word of a missing passenger. The woman who had changed clothes didn't recognize the description of herself and joined in the search. But the search was called off about 3 a.m. when it became clear that the missing woman was in fact accounted for and searching for herself. 
Just like this woman that had changed her clothes and did not recognize her description, the lost son with all his money and newfound friends probably didn't recognize himself either. The third point this morning, he was destitute and degraded. So how was the son enjoying living on his own at this point? He got to, uh, got to go to a new land away from his father, got to live it up partying, probably had lots of new friends, and then his money ran out. Luke 15, 14 through 16. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So much for his money. It's a lovely coincidence here, isn't it? He blows all of his inheritance, and now the land is in a severe famine. Where was all his new friends now? In order to survive, he was driven by his need to take employment wherever he could find it. And R.C. Sproul stated, Jesus makes it clear that the man descended into the dregs of society. In the rabbinic laws that governed employment, the occupation of swine herders was considered so debased that anyone working with swine was seen as being cursed. His work brought the prodigal son into daily contact with animals that the Old Testament had declared to be unclean, which meant that under Jewish law, he would no longer be permitted to observe the Sabbath because he himself was now unclean. He was forced for all practical purposes to renounce his Judaism his life was at the lowest point of dereliction a Jew could reach. In fact, we read in verse 16 that he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And another commentator wrote, he wallows in the pig pen with the Jewish persons considered disgustingly unclean animals. A sinful life is a riches to rag story. His life slides deep into squalor and loneliness. If you live for yourself, you'll soon live by yourself. He doesn't have a friend in the world to help him. Now this is what living apart from Christ looks like from the vantage point of heaven. God the Father watches his rich but rebellious children squander his love and his riches as they run from him to the far country of sin. Sinners want all the goodness of God's creation and all the enjoyment of God's blessings. But they do not want God himself. They do not understand his fatherhood. They refuse to return his love. Unless God restrains the sinner, they squander their lives and waste away as they chase every desire of the flesh. Life apart from God is really a slow death. Apart from God, we are living to die, but repentance is dying to live. It is dying to self that allows us to find life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Point number four, despair. How much worse could it get for him? He had nothing, and he is wallowing in his sorrows and with the pigs. Luke 15, verse 17, But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. The story takes a dramatic turn, however. Notice that Jesus doesn't say when he came to the end of his resources, or when he came to the city limits, but when he came to his senses. Jesus was aware that there are people who are lost, not only in terms of the kingdom of God, but in personal terms, they don't even know themselves. A person can get caught up in a kind of activity that he doesn't even know who he is anymore. One of the greatest abilities we have as humans is the ability to deceive ourselves, to rationalize, to make up excuses. Some of us continue to delude ourselves, postponing that painful moment of honest self-evaluation. 
But this young man woke up to the reality of what he was doing. And this could be the most critical point in his life. He realizes that he's a servant in fields, begging for the pods that swine eat. And unlike the master in the far country, the younger son, his father, is generous toward those who serve him. Humans have the capacity to change. We do not have to remain in the pig pen. We do not have to continue to live as sinners. We can become responsible for our lives. We can quit our riotous living. Matthew Henry wrote, The Lord opens his eyes and convinces him of sin. Then he views himself in every object in a different light from what he did before. Thus, the convinced sinner perceives that the meanest servant of God is happier than he is. To look unto God as a father and our father will be of great use in our repentance and return to him. Step five. Getting close, Karen. Decision time. Once he came to his senses and realized he was better off as a servant to his father, he had a decision to make. Luke 15, verses 18 and 19. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. This was not an easy decision for him. He had to go to his father and admit he was wrong and that he sinned against him. How many of us like to admit when we're wrong? The prodigal is going to go home to tell his father what he did. Remember, he had gone to a far country to escape the eye of his father, to do those things that he knew his father would not approve of. In the beginning, when he was having a good time, he said, I'm glad my father can't see me, he wouldn't understand. But now in his brokenness, he resolved to go to his father to confess that he had sinned against him and isn't worthy to be called his son. And notice how this ties the story back to the beginning of the chapter and the theme of sinners. No longer are we using animals or objects to talk about the lost. Now we have gotten down to the basics. People are lost. People need to realize their lost condition and admit it. The younger son's first step is saying, I am a sinner. And what is a sinner? An unworthy person, one who deserves nothing. Yet a sinner wants something, so the sinner searches for someone who loves the unworthy, who is willing to help the undeserving. The sinful younger brother had forfeited his position as son. He had no more claims on his father, so he applied for a new job, a day laborer. And that brings us to step six, delight and rejoicing. The younger son fully prepared to do what he needed to do in order to make things right with his father. Luke 15, verses 20 through 24. And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The young man decided to go back to his father. Think for a moment how you would feel if you were in his shoes. Not that long ago, you had left the security of your family. You had badgered your father to give you your inheritance in advance. Your father advised against it, 
but you persisted and you finally gave in. And here you are, penniless, filthy, coming back to tell your father what you have done. We might expect a young man to time his homecoming so that the household would be asleep. That way he could creep in under the cover of darkness. But this man is in a state of total brokenness. Considerations like these are not in his mind. He had suffered the laughter in the swine herder of the swine herders and those who had exploited him and taken his money. He has no shame left. And so he returns in the brightness of the day. But, says the text, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. That in itself is an astonishing part of the story. Imagine the anxiety of that father as he went to work every day in the fields. Imagine how much time he spent peering into the distance, hoping for a glimpse of his son returning. There had been no messages, no news of how his boy was faring. We are living in an age where much distress has been caused by the children who have rebelled against their family. In many cases, they have run away. And one of the most difficult things for a parent to do is to allow a child to go. But this father had paid that price and allowed the boy to leave the house. However, he had not left with his heart. He was always on the lookout for him, which is why we saw him when he was still a long way off. How did he recognize him? His appearance, doubtless, would be very different to when he left. But something in the movement of his figure in the distance told his father that this was his boy coming home. The father didn't sit down and plan what he would say to his son. He didn't rehearse or rebuke or practice an air of casual detachment. No, as soon as he saw his son, he felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him. And in the ancient world, a man of his social stature would wear great robes and be careful to follow the customs and protocols of the time. So to see such a man as he was running down the dusty roads with his robes girded at the waist was unthinkable. But he didn't care who saw him. He just wanted to get his son. And when he does, he falls upon his neck and kisses him. The son had planned his confession speech, but before he even had a chance to open his mouth, his father had forgiven him before he uttered a word. The father didn't need to hear the words. He could see the brokenness of his son. And his heart was moved to compassion, and he showed that compassion with a kiss. Each one of the items that the father commands be given to the son had special significance. The best robe. When a king sought to give honor to a visiting dignitary, he would present him with a costly robe. So the father's command carried the implication, treat this son as mine, as the guest of honor in my house. And then there was the ring, obviously a signet ring. When it was given from father to son or from king to prime minister, it signified the granting or the transfer of authority. The young man says he isn't worthy to be called a son. All he asks to be made a servant, a person of no authority. But the father, by calling for a ring to be placed on his finger, is restoring to him the authority of sonship in his father's house. And then the third command to put sandals on his feet. Shoes or sandals was a luxury. They were worn by free men, never worn by slaves. The young son had appeared at his father's house in bare feet, looking like a slave. But the father ordered that the shoes be put on his feet. After these instructions to do with his son's attire, the father then gives the command, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Now meat was rarely eaten, and so to take the fattened calf was a sign that this was an extremely special occasion, a time of feasting for the family and the servants in honor of the return of the lost son to the family table. Luke 15, verse 24 again, For this my son was dead 
and is alive again. He was a lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. And this ties all three parables together. Just like the sheep and the coin, the son was lost, but now was found. Jesus took it a step further, though. The son was dead and is alive again. Just like we are dead in our sin, but when we accept Christ and repent of our sins, we are alive again through him. It was, a, again, a time for celebration to what was found. The final point this morning is the rebuke. And I will, I will say, as I was doing my studies, reading other sermons that had been given, most pastors have already stopped with their message. They stopped at the celebration. But that wasn't the end of the story. And now it's time to circle back to why these parables were told with the Pharisees and scribes in verses 1 and 2. Luke 15, verses 25 to 32. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked that what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours came, who has devoured our property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Now this rebuke, of course, is meant for the ears of the Pharisees who were disgusted by the fact that Jesus was seeking the lost and eating with sinners. They felt no compassion for the lost. In fact, they were disgusted by them, even when one was converted, they didn't want the new convert in their company. Pride, entitlement, and self-righteousness keep him from repenting. If we think we have something to boast about before God, then we won't see our need for turning to God in repentance. This man thinks his obedience justifies him before his father, just as the Pharisees, through their self-righteousness, made them right before God. The sinner's repentance exposes the hardness of the self-righteous. A sinner's repentance should be good for a saint's heart. Though we like to imagine ourselves to be the younger brother, many of us are actually the older brother. In our self-righteousness, we tend to think that self-help is how we made it. In his book, The Prodigal Son, or Prodigal God, Timothy Keller corrects the notion that his classic parable is only about the lostness of the younger brother. In fact, as he demonstrates elsewhere, the parable concludes with the older brother outside the fellowship of his father. In other words, outside of the father's salvation. The real point of the parable is that both the older and younger brothers are lost, just in different ways. Keller explains, the hearts of the two brothers were the same. Both sons resented their father's authority and sought ways of getting out from under it. They each wanted to get into a position in which they could tell the father what to do. Each one, in other words, rebelled, but one did so by being very bad and the other by being extremely good. Both were alienated from the father's heart. Both were lost sons. Here then is Jesus' radical redefinition of what is wrong with us. Nearly everyone defines sin as breaking a list of rules. Jesus, though, shows us that a man who has violated virtually nothing on the list of moral misbehaviors can be every bit as spiritually lost as the most immoral person. Why? Because sin is not just breaking the rules. It is putting yourself in the place of God as Savior. 
Lord, and judge, just as each son sought to displace the authority of the father in his own life. William Barclay wrote, We must finally note that these three parables are not simply three ways of stating the same thing. There is a difference. The sheep went lost through sheer foolishness. It did not think. And many of us would escape sin if we thought in time. The coin was lost through us through no fault of its own. Many are led astray. And God will not hold anyone guiltless who has taught another to sin. The son deliberately went lost, callously turning his back on his father. The love of God can defeat, defeat human folly, the seduction of the tempting voices, and even the deliberate rebellion of the heart. Every Christian has lived this wonderful story of the prodigal son in one way or another. The essence of conversion is the experience of forgiveness. The experience of the grace of God. The great tragedy is that there are so many people still wandering in a far country, afraid to come home. But our God is like this father who, when he sees us in the distance, runs towards us and falls upon our necks and hugs us and kisses us. He doesn't make us go over all the lurid details of our lostness and wastefulness, but he welcomes us into his family and forgives us. And that's grace. No one will ever get into the Father's house by pleading their own worthiness. Only those who acknowledge their unworthiness will get there. I could have gone another week probably just on the, on the final son, but I wanted to spare you. How many of you Are like the sons. We've all lived it at one point. And how many of us are living as the older son now? The Pharisees didn't care about anyone coming to know God. They wanted sinners to be destroyed by God. How many of us, when we see someone come and accept Jesus, are in joy? How many of us have seen someone that has backslidden and left the church? And when they come back, how many of them accept them and welcome them back home? That's kind of like what the older son's doing, in a way. We need to make sure that we are accepting of everyone when they accept Christ. We need to be accepting of everyone no matter where their walk in, in life is. However, we also need to make sure that we're following Christ's teachings. The LGBT stuff is so front and center in, in the world today. We still love all those people, but it doesn't mean that we accept that as a lifestyle or that it's not a sin. But it's not for us to judge that either. It's for us to love that person, to show them the love of Jesus. Because maybe they're struggling because they don't see Jesus in anybody else. except from us. You may only have one chance at someone to show them the love of Jesus. Are you doing that? Throughout this whole time, Luke 15 showed that God is always searching for the lost. Are you also searching for the lost? 
Because Jesus gave us a mandate to go forth. Spread the gospel. Spread my words. And make disciples. Are we doing that? Are we actively going out and searching for those that need Christ? Or are we just sitting in our home not caring that we lost a coin? Heavenly Father, we're, we're thankful, Lord, that you love us so much. Lord, you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to come walk this earth to live as we do to be tempted as we are and yet Jesus never fell to temptation Jesus taught us how to love one another how to be accepting of each other Lord Jesus, in your love, was so strong that he took our sins upon his shoulders. He took your just wrath so that we may not have to suffer it. He took all that pain and suffering and agony upon himself so that we would not have to deal with that. that we can go to him in love. We can go to you and fall on our knees before you and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We can go before you and confess our sins and be forgiven and look forward to an eternity of serving and worshiping you. There are so many that are lost. And there are many that knew you once and turned their back. And Lord, we know it's never too late for them to come back until Jesus comes. So until that day, Lord, have the Spirit guide us to the lost. To share your love with them. to share your words, to feed them so that they hunger and thirst no more. For them to come home to you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.